All right. Plato, as we know, is the student of Socrates. And we often draw a distinction between the earlier Platonic dialogues, which largely are concerned with matters of virtue, the teachings of Socrates, and the later Platonic dialogues, in which we find Plato's own mature philosophy, which includes his metaphysical theory, which is usually referred to as the theory of forms. Okay? Plato's theory of forms. We'll understand what he means by forms in short order. But I'd like to begin the discussion of Plato's theory of reality, such as metaphysics is, with what might seem to be a shocking claim. If I were to ask you, what is real? Show me something real. What would you say? Sure. Something physical. The desk. The piece of chalk. The earth. The things that resist my body. We say that seeing is believing. Okay? For Plato, none of this is real. We live in a world of shadows, of images. The chair, the desk, the trees, even your own body is not the real thing. It is all an illusion. Or more specifically, a representation of something else. We live in a world of appearances. Naturally, the question arises, appearances of what? Well, appearances of reality. But what is that? To begin the discussion, I want to draw the basic metaphysical distinction which Plato makes. He is a dualist, a metaphysical dualist. And what does that mean? What does dual mean? It means two. So for Plato, reality in the broadest sense <coughs> consists of two basic realms or domains or worlds. There is the visible realm. And that is the world within which we live. Anything that you can see or touch, the realm of the senses is referred to by Plato as the visible realm. And we'll see as we move along why he opts for the visual paradigm, even though it includes hearing, touching, tasting, smelling, etc. Okay? But the visible realm, all of this, which seems so real, is just a reflection. It is an appearance, much like your appearance in a mirror, of what he calls the intelligible realm. And as the name suggests, the intelligible realm cannot be seen. It cannot be accessed with our five senses, but rather must be approached by an act of intellect. We must think our way 
into the realm of the intelligible, which is more real than the things given to our senses. Anything that you can sense is an appearance of something intelligible. What is most real for Plato, and we will become familiar with this way of referring to reality as hierarchical, such that some things are more real than others. What is most real for Plato, what is ultimately real, are what he calls the forms, or ideas. Okay. But these are not ideas in the ordinary sense, in the sense in which an idea is contained in a mind. These ideas are disembodied. They are rather ideals. Okay? And these ideas are eternal and perfect. They are the origin <coughs> of everything else which exists. And for anything which does exist, whether it be a table or a chair or a tree, or an act of virtue, or a thing of beauty, there is a form or idea that is its origin. So let's begin with my, what might be a rather trivial example. There are many desks in this room. And each one of these desks is identified as a desk because it exhibits certain properties. As Plato would put it, anything that I would identify as a desk participates in the idea of a desk. Right? Now, some desks are better than others. If you're sitting in one that's wobbling, okay, or has a rough surface that makes it difficult to write upon, you would say that that desk is not as good as another. Now, Plato asks, what makes it possible for you to render that judgment? Likewise, if I say something like this, <clears throat> here is a series of circles, yet none of them is perfect. They are, they are highly imperfect. And yet, if I were pressed, I could say, this is probably the best of the three. Maybe this is the second and third. What makes it possible for me to rank these circles in a hierarchy? How do I identify them as circles in the first place? 
and what makes it possible for me to judge them successful circles or as failures at being a circle? The criteria that we've assigned them. Okay. There is some criteria or standard, some idea of what it means to be a circle. And of course, geometrical shapes are perhaps the easiest way of expressing what Plato means by participation. Because we know exactly what it means to be a circle. The idea of a circle, or the ideal circle, the form of a circle, although I can't really represent it physically because the ideas are not physical, is a series of points lying in a plane equidistant from the center. Okay? And it is because I already possess an idea of what it means to be a perfect circle that it is possible for me to identify particular circles in the visible world and to judge them according to how well they reflect the ideal. All right? Now, the theory of forms, I think, is intended to be used ideally for the virtues or for concepts such as beauty or love. And we do it some degree of disservice when we apply it to things like desks and tables and chairs and clocks, okay? The point is simply this. For Plato, the more perfect, which is sort of a weird way of speaking because perfect is perfect, but the closer something gets to being perfect, the more real that thing is. And so, in a series of circles, those circles which most closely approximate the perfect circle, which, mind you, can only be an idea, are more real than those which succeed to a lesser extent in participating in that perfect idea. Let me give you another illustration. Now, of course, bear in mind that all of these metaphors fail fundamentally, because I'm talking about things in the physical world, and the forms themselves lie not in a physical world, but a world of ideas. Okay? The forms are invisible, they are eternal, they are perfect, they are archetypes, and all things which participate in these ideas are tokens. Okay. If an architect draws up plans for a house and gives it to a construction firm, the builders may erect a number of houses in a subdivision, each of which is modeled after the blueprint provided by the architect. Okay. 
So each physical house is a reflection of the blueprint which tells us how the house ought to be. This is what the house should look like. And each particular physical house will participate in that plan or live up to that plan to a greater or lesser extent. So if we enter this subdivision and we're shopping for a house, we may notice that one of them has walls that aren't finished very well. Okay? Another one may obviously have boards that weren't quite straight. Okay? And so Plato would ask, what made it possible for me to judge between these houses? How do I choose which is the best one to buy? Well, I compare them against my idea of what the perfect one would be. Now, the thing is, again, the theory really works best when we're talking about ideas like virtue, justice, temperance, piety, courage. Or beauty. Consider beauty. I might say that here is a beautiful painting, or a beautiful sculpture, or a beautiful piece of music, or a beautiful sentiment, a beautiful person. Yet, what makes these various things beautiful is hard to pinpoint, because two things may be the same color, right, yet one of them is beautiful and one of them isn't. Two things may be constructed of the same shapes, while one is beautiful and one is not. And yet we still somehow render judgments. So Plato's claim is that what makes it possible for us to render judgments of what is better and worse, or successful or not, is that we are already in possession of some vague idea <coughs> of what perfection is for each of these concepts. And yet, our understanding is cloudy. It can always be refined. And so Socrates might begin, for example, in the Republic, which I've asked you to read section from, by asking his friends, what really is justice? What is justice, really? I know how it appears to be. You know, when somebody gets what they deserve, I say, well, this is justice. But what is it that actually makes some behavior or arrangement just? And, of course, his interlocutor will give a response. For example, in Book One of the Republic, one of Socrates' companions says that justice is paying your debts. Okay? And Socrates says, all right, certainly paying off your debts is a just thing to do. But, what if that which you owe 
to somebody is to return a weapon. Someone has lent you their samurai sword, <laughs> and they've come to re retrieve it, but you can tell that there's something wrong. Your friend is enraged. He's saying crazy things, like he wants to kill somebody. Would it be just to hand the weapon over in that condition? Ordinarily, sure, it's his. I ought to give it back. But in this particular situation, giving it back may lead to a grave injustice, an injustice which outweighs the injustice of postponing the return of this weapon. Okay? So, his interlocutor would then have to modify the response. And then we would evaluate the modified response. And this back and forth dialectic is what we mean by the Socratic method. The idea being that through question and answer and analysis, we can move from a position of relative understanding of some idea to a more enlightened understanding of some idea. And even though, so long as we are here with these bodies, distracted by our senses, we cannot ever achieve a perfect understanding of the forms. We can get closer. And if you remember what we discussed in Socrates about forgetting and remembering, the idea that learning is remembering, you see how Plato's theory of reality nicely accommodates Socrates' notion of education. Perhaps before we are born, we have a more direct encounter with what perfection is. And the task of learning is remembering this original perfection. Now, the th one thing we've got to remember about the forms or ideas is that they not only make it possible for us to think about various things. They are also the origin of all things. Okay. The forms are both the principle of illumination and origination. Now, what do I mean by that? Again, an oversimplification might be something like this. What makes it possible for there to be rectangles in the visible world, like each of these ceiling tiles is a rectangle. Okay? There are rectangles all over the place. But what makes it possible for there to be a plurality of physical rectangles is that each is a reflection of the form of rectangle itself. As if the form was the mother of all rectangles. Now, whether or not there ever was a physical rectangle. Let's say that suddenly we 
have a collision with an enormous asteroid. Okay, and the Earth is just obliterated. No more rectangles in the physical plane. Or if you want to think on a grander scale, all matter in the universe suddenly reduced to pure energy. I shouldn't say reduced, just transferred. So there are no more physical shapes. Still, it will eternally be true that the opposite sides of a rectangle are parallel. It's eternally true that a triangle contains 180 degrees. Okay. And Plato thinks this way about all the ideas. Now, of course, you cannot help but to hear echoes of Christianity. And there's a reason for that, of course. St. Augustine <coughs> was a Platonist. And interpreted scripture largely in terms of his understanding of Plato. The difference is that, of course, in the Christian or Judeo-Christian Islamic account of things, the original perfection that is the origin of the physical world is the mind of God. While for Plato, there was not one God, there was a profusion of gods. And while these gods have a closer perspective on the ideal, these forms are not contained in the mind of any god. Okay? They are ideals that exist eternally independent of any mind. Now, there are different words that we can use to refer to these domains, the domain of the intelligible versus that of the visible. For example, the intelligible realm <coughs> is the realm of being. It is, plain and simple. Whereas anything in the visible realm is in a state of becoming. Becoming what? Like the forms. Okay. Everything in our physical world is in a state of change. Things come into existence, they mature, and then they begin to deteriorate and they pass out of existence. Physical things are always becoming in one direction or the other. The visible realm is a domain of change. The intelligible, however, does not change. And as we'll see in a few moments, part of the intelligible world is mathematical. Whether or not there ever was a triangle, a triangle is essentially and eternally 
a three-sided closed figure lying in a plane consisting of exactly 180 degrees. That doesn't change. 1 plus 1 equals 2. Eternally, whether or not there are two of anything. Now, perhaps the most important thing we've got to remember when it comes to understanding this metaphysical theory is that the forms are not abstractions. It is not the case that, for example, after having experienced a number of different chairs, for example, I find the common denominator, the thing which all chairs have in common, and abstract an idea of a perfect chair. The form exists first. They are ontologically prior to anything which participates. Okay. Now this term ontologically refers to being. Okay. Onto in Greek means being. Okay. So ontology is the study of being. The ontologist asks, what does it mean to be? And not just what it means to be this or that, but what does it mean to be at all? <clears throat> what does the is consist of? When I say that there are lots of different kinds of things, the desk is, the chair is, I am, the world is. As a metaphysician, I want to know what it really means to be a chair, or what it really means to be beautiful or just. As an ontologist, I want to go a little bit deeper. I want to know what it means to be as such. What does it mean to be at all? It's a very subtle distinction. We'll come back to it toward the end of the semester. So did you say Plato believed the forms transcended the gods? Yes. Did St. Augustine believe that about the one God No, too, or did he that's believe? of course where, they, where there's a di divergence, right? One way that I t will teach Plato is simply by making reference to the story of creation found in, in the Old Testament because it's more familiar to us, okay? So, you know, when God says, according to the story in Genesis, let there be light, let there be an earth, right? Let there be all sorts of swimming things and creepy crawly things and let them, let the earth give forth all kinds of animal and plant life and so forth. Whatever God was thinking the moment before creation was the plan, the original perfect plan. But of course, after he creates things, things go downhill, right? In large measure, according to the story, because, well, we were hungry for fruit. Or we wanted to know. And so just as in the story of creation, the world that we live in is fallen. Fallen away from its original perfection. And so the task of living, spiritually <clears throat> speaking, is to return to our original perfection, right?
to do penance for temporal sin, right? In Plato, the world is fallen away from the perfection of the forms, but not through a, not through a fault of our own. It's just the way things are. Remember, everything in this world is a reflection. And some things are better reflections than others. If I look in the mirror, that is a very good reflection of my body. Pretty close to perfect. Or I could attempt to draw myself, and that would be another reflection of my body, but it wouldn't be as good as the one in the mirror. Now, of course, we got into theory of art and impressionism and things like that, then, you know, we might interpret what it means to be a good reflection much differently. But in terms of Plat Platonism, the more perfect something is, meaning the closer a thing approximates its respective form, the more real it is. And that carries over into Christianity. All right. So that which is in being is eternal. It is perfect. Unchanging archetypal, whereas everything which reflects that which is, is in a state of becoming. It is temporal. That is, it exists in time, in space. It changes. It is imperfect. It is a copy. And so, if you think back to Socrates now, and his self-proclaimed mission of helping us to wake up, from this sleepwalk in which we mistake appearance for reality. You understand that from a platonic point of view, the, the most basic mistake that we make is taking this physical world for the real thing. And upon our death, it may turn out that it is very much like waking up from a dream. You know how you feel when you, are, when, when you awake, awaken from a dream and it's, it's shocking how what seemed so real a moment ago now shows up for what it was, hazy vague. Imagine waking up from this and having the same realization. <coughs> Wouldn't that be a trip? <laughs> okay. Um, so I understand point from like the uh, visible, like if we're trying to become <coughs> like that idea or original form, how do we become that if Maybe like, for example, we have a flawed perception of what the form is, like love. You know, like there, there's unconditional love, but there's also like reckless love. Like, how do we become like that original form of, and not have a flawed perception of what that is? For Plato and Socrates, ethics must follow metaphysics. In other words, 
doing wrong, moral error is the result of metaphysical error. <coughs> the reason that we commit moral offenses, the reason we do what is bad or evil, is because we have a misunderstanding of what is good. In fact, Socrates has a doctrine which is sometimes called the Socratic Paradox that says nobody does wrong knowingly. That if I do something wrong, it's because I have failed to understand the wrongness of it. Because nobody would intentionally do themselves harm. And if I really understood what I'm doing to myself when I am unjust or intemperate or impious, then I would never do it. Okay. Now you may say, well, wait a minute. We do, we do things wrong knowing that it's the wrong thing to do all the time. Sure. But what... What Socrates would say is, if you, if you genuinely understood, if you could see what you're doing to yourself, it would make you sick. You would not do it. Okay? So, indeed, moral improvement depends upon intellectual improvement. Okay. Yes. What time did we begin? Twelve thirty. Okay. Yeah, till quarter till. Excellent. All right. Yes. Do things like that apply to maybe it's like so sociopaths that can't differentiate good? Always keep this in mind, okay? But I'm going to take you basically through the history of metaphysics in the West. And this is but a theory, okay? This is one way of making sense of things. In fact, Plato himself is pretty clear. <coughs> he says, I don't know if forms really exist, okay? In other places, he says they do. But he, at least in one place I know of, he says, I cannot prove to you that forms exist. But if they do, if there is a real good and I don't seek it, then certainly I have missed out on an opportunity. If it turns out that the forms don't exist, I haven't lost anything. Okay? This, later turned, this is later formulated into a principle by people like Pascal. Pascal's wager, it's always better to believe in God. Because if he exists and you, and you believe, you're in good shape. If he exists and you don't believe, you're in bad shape. If he doesn't exist and you believe, it makes no difference. So you're always better off believing than not believing. Okay. Wouldn't he know? <clears throat> Wouldn't he know you went through that logic? Wouldn't God know you went through that logic? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, but, uh, <laughs> you know, he's, uh, I'm not sure he cares why we do what he says, <laughs> just as long as we do. No, he does, I'm sure, if he exists. Right, that's right. All right, so, now what I want to do is, Turn to the reading, okay? What I assigned you to read is books, uh, the end of book six and the beginning of book seven of Plato's Republic. This is one of two places, the other being the Phaedo, in which we get a statement of 
the theory of forms. Okay? And in the Republic, the explanation of reality begins like this, just to give you, give you some background. The Republic itself, if anybody were to ask you, well, well you know, what's Plato's Republic about? It's about justice. The question in the Republic is, what is justice? And when Socrates asks, what is justice? He wants to know what the essence of justice is. What is it in itself? Not simply what kinds of actions count as just or unjust, but what is the essence of justice? What makes something just or unjust? Okay. And the essence of something is located in the form. Okay. Now this sounds very strange, and I grant you it's a very strange way to speak. If I say, look, here is a just man, a just woman, a just <coughs> contract, a just action, the essence <coughs> of the justness of these things does not lie in the physical actions. It lies in the form. And this is why Aristotle rejects theory of forms, as we'll see next time. Okay. So Socrates and his friends have been looking for the essence of justice. And they come to a conclusion, it's a tentative conclusion, of course, because Socrates always believes there's further room for improvement. But by the end of book two, and there are ten books in the Republic, Socrates has made the claim that justice is a harmony. Okay? I don't want to get too much into this because it goes beyond what's relevant for the theory of forms. But justice, like the other virtues, okay, like temperance and piety, are good. It is good to be just. It is good to be temperate. It's good to be pious. It's good to be courageous. They are parts or facets of this thing we call goodness. And for Plato, the good gets elevated to a metaphysical principle such that the forms, no matter what particular form you're dealing with, because I can't talk about the form of beauty or temperance or justice, the forms are all aspects of the good. What is ultimately real for Plato is what he calls the good. Of course, there is moral goodness, such if I say, yes, that was a good or just action. And there is non-moral goodness, like if I say, you know, that was a good ice cream cone. Okay? So anything which exists is in some sense a reflection of the good. And one way I suppose you can think about it is like this. For one thing, the intelligible realm, or the realm of forms, is a unity. Okay? <clears throat> All the forms culminate or come together in the form of the good. It is a unity. And from that idea arises Plato's doctrine of the unity of the virtues. Okay? 
he argues that to have one virtue is to have all virtues. You cannot have one without having the others. I can't really be courageous unless to some extent I am just. I cannot be just unless I am also pious and so forth. Okay? And I could, I could substantiate that for you. I mean, but that would be more the kind of thing for an ethics course. Yet the, root, the realm we live in is a realm of plurality. Okay, so many beautiful things, each of which is a participant or a reflection of beauty itself, which is a unity. Okay. Our world is fragmented. Okay. Anything which exists is a piece, a reflection of the one eternal thing Plato calls the good. So, as the Republic proceeds, the discussion turns to a political one, because they want to know, well, what kinds of government would be most likely to exemplify justice, okay? But then, in book six, Glaucon, who has really been the character that has advanced the conversation with Socrates all along, Glaucon says to Socrates, you've done such a good job, Socrates, explaining to us the meaning of justice. Can you now explain to us what you mean by the good? Justice is part of the good, so what is the good itself? And Socrates says, this I really can't do. All right? Because what you're asking me now is to explain the ultimate principle that explains everything else. You know, when I explain something to you, I always explain it in terms of something else, right? If you ask me to define a term, I define it in terms of terms that you are already familiar with. So how could I possibly explain what the good is when everything is a reflection of it? So Socrates says, look, instead of telling you directly what the good is, which I could never do, let me suggest a metaphor, an analogy. Now, what is the analogy he asks us to consider? This is where I discover whether you've done your reading. Which, by the way, I already know because I know when you open files, I know every mouse click that you make in Blackboard. So. <laughs> your reading. Socrates suggests this. The good, this ultimate metaphysical principle, is like the sun. Okay? Our sun. And the role that the sun plays in our visible world is like a microcosm or a reflection of the role that the good plays in the intelligible realm and ultimately the role it plays in reference to everything including the visible realm. In fact our sun is kind of like the offspring of the good. 
The good is the parent. The son is the child. And so by drawing an analogy, he hopes to explain something which is unfamiliar to us, something that I cannot really explain directly, by comparing it to something with which we are familiar. Okay? And that, of course, is always the structure of analogy. Right? In an analogy, I will say, look, A is to B as C is to D. Okay? So I'm saying that the sun is, to the visible world, what the good is to the intelligible world. And we begin with this, this parallelism. <clears throat> if I ask you, what makes it possible for me to see this object. What does my vision of this thing presuppose? That's a beloved buzzword of metaphysicians, presuppose. It basically means assume. Okay? So if I say that, if I ask you what does the rain presuppose? You might say the rain cloud. The cloud makes the rain possible. Okay? So if X presupposes Y, Y makes X possible. It is the principle of explanation. So what must I presuppose in order for me to see this visible thing? <coughs> Okay, I've got to have my eyes, right? The thing that sees, what else? Brain. Let's include all that with the visual, okay? Like what makes the chalk possible? What, what makes my vision of it possible? Light. Okay, now you're too sophisticated already. Okay, but that's good. Of course, yes, we're going to need the light. But I also, of course, need the chalk, right? So I, I need the thing that does the seeing. I need the eye and all of its apparatus and all the optic nerve and all of this stuff. I need the thing seen, okay? So subject, object, but I also need a light source, which you've already said, okay? Well, just as the sun imparts visibility to the things that we see. The good imparts intelligibility to things thought. Let me say it again. Just as the sun gives visibility to the things we see, the good gives think-ability or intelligibility to the things we think. That is the basic analogy. Okay? I see the chalk requires my visual apparatus. It requires the chalk as the object of sight and a light source. Likewise, in order for me, for example, to think about something beautiful, it requires the mind that does the thinking, the thing about which I am thinking, okay, and an idea against which my mind 
compares this object. When I call something triangular, what makes that possible is that I can compare this particular thing to my idea of what triangularity really is. If I call this painting beautiful, what makes that possible is that I am comparing it or holding it up against some standard, some vague conception that I have of what it is to be beautiful. Now, of course, I can't get my mind wrapped around it. I can't tell you exactly what it means to be beautiful any more than I can tell you exactly what it means to be courageous or pious or temperate. Because there are, are nuances. There are, you know, there are exceptions. But to make this clearer, he suggests two more analogies. Okay, so we begin with the idea that the sun will represent the good, the form of the good. Okay? <coughs> good, for Plato, is ultimate reality. Now, Socrates asks us to draw a line, all right? And this line, he asks us to divide in two unequal segments, and then to subdivide each of these segments by the same proportion. All right. Now, what he wants to do here is to give us a visual representation of the structure of reality. Now, of course, part of the visible world that we live in are shadows and reflections. Okay? And in some sense, these are the thinnest or most attenuated aspects of the visible world. I mean, a shadow is not just nothing, because we can refer to it. I know what it is. I can identify one. But it's nothing more than really an absence of light. Okay? But we know that this whole world of the senses, according to Plato, is a shadow or a reflection. Okay? So let's just begin here. Let's say that belonging to our world are images, shadows on the ground, reflections, representations of things, okay? The question Plato or Socrates asks us is this. What makes images possible given that there is a shadow or a reflection? What do these appearances presuppose? What makes them possible? What grounds the shadow? Where does it come from? If I look in the mirror, mm -hmm. I see a reflection. Is that original? Yes. An object, right? The shadow on the ground presupposes the thing casting the shadow. Right? Okay. So images presuppose or assume physical objects.
Now, why would I say that the physical objects of our visible world are more fundamental than the images which they cast? Okay. I like that because, after all, a three-dimensional Im image captures more of something than a two-dimensional image does, right? So it participates to a greater degree in the thing being represented. You guys catch that? Okay. The objects make the images possible That's right. with light. Okay. I... The first part of what you said really answers it. The object makes the image possible. The image doesn't make the object possible. The physical object can exist without the image, but the image cannot exist without the physical object. Okay? So in Platonic language, we would say that the physical object transcends its image. What if the image is a perception in your mind? You're thinking about it. Even so, you are. Before you can think of something, you are representing it. And even if, even if you are, if you're using your imagination creatively, actively, so that I take, for let me say, I take the color of the of the fire alarm, the red, and I mix it with the shape of the desk. I can easily imagine a red desk. Okay. But ultimately, that can be traced back to some physical thing, which I had to encounter first. All right? Wouldn't that just prove the point more? Even if you saw an image, it doesn't make an object possible. No. Right, of course. It's the other way around. Yes, the other way around. All right. But now, just as I have explained something about the metaphysical hierarchy of the visible plane, I can ask the same thing of physical objects. <clears throat> if images are made possible by physical objects, what makes physical objects possible? Now, this is a much more difficult question. Because now we are stepping out of the physical plane and entering into the metaphysical. Ideal. Okay. Something ideal. Something non-physical. Okay. Now I want to try to evoke this answer from you. It's a good response. What Plato does here is first to explain the order of reality. He will then explain the epistemological order, or the part of consciousness which corresponds to each level of reality. Okay? Just as a physical object requires <coughs> the eye to be seen, okay? Just as, you know, the chalk requires the hand to be grasped. He's going to ask, well, what, what is it about our, our mind that makes it possible to grasp images and, and physical objects and so forth? But he puts that off for a minute, okay? Right now, we're dealing with the metaphysical order of things. So here's the question again. Images are grounded in physical objects. Okay? I can represent, I can express this relationship to you in any number of ways. I can say images presuppose physical objects, or physical objects ground or transcend images. Okay? But as we move up this ladder, we are getting more fundamental, which means for Plato, more real or more perfect. Okay? 
Would it be like laws, like gravity and physics? Yeah, you're on the right track for sure. For sure, okay? Let's think about physics. Let's think about chemistry, okay? What's the whole physical world made up of? Atoms. Atoms. And the atoms are the various elements, right? I mean, an atom of helium, of hydrogen, of aluminum, of whatever, okay? And what is the difference between one atom and another atom? Electrons, protons. Numbers, right? An atomic weight, okay? I can express the difference between one kind of thing and another kind of thing numerically, right? What's the difference between water and hydrogen peroxide? An oxygen molecule, or an uh, atom, right? What's the difference between one species of animal and another? Something numerical, chromosomal difference. DNA. Yeah. Difference between a triangle and a square, a number of degrees. Okay? And although we didn't really talk about the pre-Socratic philosophers, one of the famous ones, Pythagoras, with whom you are probably familiar, because you had to know the Pythagorean theorem to get out of high school, Pythagoras thought that the world was made up of numbers. Okay. I can't explain the difference between this thing and that thing in terms of measurement. Atoms, numbers, okay? And so according to Plato, what makes physical objects possible are mathematical relationships. Which is another way of talking about chemistry and physics. Well. Sure, I yes. Think. Okay? And... Notice that just as an object can exist without its image, mathematical relationships are eternal, whether or not they have exemplars in the physical world. Whether or not there was ever a physical triangle, a three-sided closed figure lying in a plane will always eternally have 180 degrees. But now is the most difficult question. What makes mathematical relationships possible? And his answer is the good. The good. Okay? The good. Okay? Or the culmination of the forms. Now, the, the most I can say to you about this, just like Plato says, I cannot tell you what the forms are. All I can do is allude to them by analogy. What the sun does in the physical plane, the good does in the intellectual plane. But if you think about what all mathematical relationships have in common is their perfection. They are reflections of some primordial eternal perfection.